Hey everyone, good morning. Welcome to the Saturday Morning Tech Show. My name is Todd Cochran, and we've got uh, two guests on board with us this morning. We've got Mike Dell, Geek of the North, up on uh, on the top monitor. Uh, good morning, uh, good morning, Mike. How are you this morning? Morning, Todd. How's it going? Good to be on. I wore the uh, Hawaiian shirt for uh, you know since you're based there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're wearing Aloha, and I'm not. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for showing up in uh, spirit that way and of course we've got Andy McCaskey uh down on bottom uh hi Andy, yeah, I'm on you? the southern uh, the southern monitor he's the <laughs> geek of the north and I guess I'm geek of the south that's right so you guys are up in bushy and of course both of you guys were like traveling this morning I, I know Andy you drove in from from Chicago and uh and, right. and Mike you said you've been out and about and drove 200 miles this morning so pretty good considering it's only noon uh, there in your neck of the woods this morning. So I had to get up early. Do, do you know what happens when I uh, when I drive two hundred miles here? I Back home. I end up my driveway. <laughs> 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 There's no other place to go. So uh, well, anyway, good morning, everyone, and uh, we got a lot to talk about this morning, of course. But first thing I want to do is uh, take care of of our sponsor so that. Uh, we can uh, pay the bandwidth bill at least for this bad boy. <laughs> but uh, this morning we want to talk just a little bit about Citrix Go to Meeting, and I want to tell you a little experience I had uh, yesterday. Or actually, about this past week has been kind of interesting because it's uh, it's been seems to me it was Meeting Week this week, and I uh, um, either I was initiating meetings or someone else was, and. You know, so I, I really you know, what I what I did this week was kind of an experiment. I normally say, "Hey, I, I you know I've got to go to a meeting. Do you want me to initiate a meeting?" Um, and it, and then they get a reply, "Oh no, 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 I'll send you an invite." And it's like all week there was go to meeting invites that were coming in from other businesses that uh, um, that I had never done business with before, and it was just kind of one of these litmus tests. I didn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what was going to come in the email. Uh, from what kind of an invite, but it was uh, pretty remarkable um, that uh, it was basically a hundred percent go to meeting week, including me sitting in uh, uh, my kids. This is the second one I've had in my kids' uh, schoolyard parking lot with uh, doing a meeting on my iPad. But you know, this summer everyone is you know really on the move and they have a lot of different schedules going on and uh, vacation, shorter days, and so forth. And you know, really. It's not shorter days. Summers is like longer days. You know, it seems like I'm doing more during the summer than I would in the winter. But uh, irregardless, we're we're all busy. So so meeting with your clients and colleagues in person can be um, impossible. And me being here in Hawaii, it's there's some geographic restrictions sometimes. So of course that's why I recommend go to meeting with uh, with the HD faces. Now, you know, it lets you meet face to face no matter where you are. Because you know, just a prime example there, sitting in that uh, parking lot. In uh, in my kid's school, doing a go to meeting session with the iPad propped up on the steering wheel, had he, you know, his, he laughed about it. But you know, I said, "Hey, I'm taking my kids to school. You just you had to meet at this specific time, or to been back in the office." But again, it takes a webcam and a click to collaborate in a group HD video, and you can even join from an iPad. And go to meeting by Citrix really lets you feel instantly connected, um, even if you're a thousand miles apart. And, uh, of course, that iPad app and the Android app is fantastic. So as a listener of this show, and this is what's real easy, folks. If you are listening for the first time, you definitely want to get over to uh, gotomeeting.com and uh, click on the Try It Free button. You're going to get a free 30-day trial there. When you click on that Try It Free button, you'll come to a page. You're just going to have to enter the promo code podcast. So, again, visit gotomeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use the promo code podcast. Be sure to use the promo code. And we want to thank GoToMeeting for being a uh, sponsor here. And I know, Andy, hey, what would you say, Andy? Go ahead. Yeah, one of the things that I, uh, you, you might find it kind of humorous, but uh, I would say uh, one of the practices I have as people call in and they send me invites for various meeting systems and stuff, I'll go ahead and just start up a GoToMeeting privately. You know, I won't even tell anyone about it. Uh, and so I'll be there to use the appointed tool or watch people try and set up the appointed tool. And, you know, if, if they're having difficulty, if they're having problems, I'll just say, hey, I've got to go to meeting session set up. Um, why don't we just flip over there? And, uh, and it's amazing. Probably 20 percent of the time 
it's like I'm able to save that meeting because I'm just able to bring up go to meeting and some of these other tools just just do not operate as well or as easily. Yeah, and I know I just and I think that um I don't even to me it's just like a natural start of a click a button and it starts and it's ready to go. It's not even a it's just an integral way of do business now. I it just you know, it just is and uh and I know it works. <laughs> That's the part of the it, standard package. Yeah, you know, standard toolkit of of stuff to use. But um, anyway, we want to thank again Citrix uh, and Go to Meeting for being a sponsor here. Get get that free trial. We definitely appreciate it. Well, guys, um, got a lot to talk about today. Um, there's a couple of uh, weird things I want to cover, but we obviously have to talk about uh, about Samsung yesterday. Really, just getting. Getting the floor mopped by, you know, Apple just cleaned their clocks in, in, a, in a big way. And, there, and there's going to be huge, huge ramifications of this uh, sometime next month when, when, when Apple starts asking for products to be taken off shelves. And, uh, you know, if you want that uh, Nexus and all those other products, you better go get one now. But um, one, I guess they had to readjust it, but it was one point zero five nine billion or something to that effect um was the initial um penalty assigned by the jury the judge has the option of uh basically tripling that because of the uh, one of the findings was that they were egregious and that they were egregiously um essentially uh violating um, I know I've got a big issues with this whole patent system to begin with. Some of this stuff is so, you know, I, you know, you know. Can can you can you design a battery? Can you tell it tell you know? Can you tell a manufacturer that you know the battery's round, has two silver ends, has a little protrusion on the end, and has a little gold stripe on? You know, there's only so many ways you can design a battery, right? And you you you, you get a cell phone, and you know. Okay, you, it's cell phone can be square. It can have rounded edges. You know that there's only like, what is there? And you can make it a little more narrow, a little thicker. You know, there's not a lot of things you can do to change natural design. It's just nature. So I, you know, people are gonna say, oh, they came out with it first. It's theirs. Da 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 da. And you know, we'll have to give the jury the benefit of the doubt that to saying that uh, you know what they found was egregious. But I just had the major heartburn with the whole patent system to begin with you know the next I, thing they're, they're gonna do they're gonna say that uh if, unless you invented the car you gotta have five wheels on it or, or you know something that's that's what i thought about it you know it's like of course the cell phone's gonna be sort of square i mean you know all these touch screen phones are that way yeah and I, you know my galaxy nexus i got sitting over here doesn't look anything like an iphone Except for the basic, you know, it's a square box with a screen, you know. And I don't know, Andy. What's you know, what's what's your thought? I, I think we need. To, I, I think that uh, the uh, uh, it has to be prefaced with uh, you know the famous "I am not a lawyer" uh, disclaimer, because you know, what might appear from a common sense standpoint to be uh, you know to, to be an obvious design you know it, it obviously hands tend to be rectangular so devices that work in your hand will tend to follow that shape uh, I mean that seems to be obvious but the I think a lot of what uh, what's at stake here is not necessarily technology patents but design patents which is like its own subset uh, that has its own set of rules. That uh, and that's where a lot of this, uh, you know, finding comes. Not that the jury says this is unique from a common sense standpoint, but they are following the letter of the way the laws, uh, in fact, are, are written. You know, they they um, they ticked off one by one a huge number of Samsung smartphones, its Galaxy tablet. Um, the jury in particular found Samsung's Fastinate X4 G, the Galaxy S2 smartphones were rogue products that warranted more than a hundred million each in damages. At the same time, the jury uh, uh, rejected Samsung's counterclaims that Apple infringed some of its wireless technology patents. The jurors reached a 
verdict on the third day of, of, deliberate, of deliberations. But legal experts basically are saying that Apple just got about everything it could want um, from the verdict. It was a huge win. And um, Apple attorney Michael Jacobs told U.S. District Judge Lisi Co., and I'm getting this from mercurynews.com, that the company moved to block the sale of many of the products in the United States within seven days. She'd already issued a preliminary injunction against the Nexus phone and Galaxy 10.1 tablet. Um, you know, this uh, this is just, um, well, you know, what it is is we're going to now have manufacturers that are, I, I believe that this verdict will do more to stifle innovation and movement forward of all products that are on the market. I just, you know, this is just going to open uh, Pandora's gate. And, right. you know, as, as a small company, Andy, I, you know, I, you know, we're going to talk about a patent that uh, uh, Apple just got on podcasting here in a little bit. But let's, uh, you know, who's next on the list? Mm -hmm. well, I think one thing that bears here is the relationship between um – uh, and obviously, this goes back a lot to the personality, I think, of Steve of Steve Jobs. But the 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 relationship between Pixar and Disney, and um, and the way that Disney has been able to bring uh, you know uh, astounding legal resources to uh, uh, to modifying copyright to their own ends over the over the years. That, uh, that I suspect that uh, Apple would be taking a similar model here. Well, one thing's for sure, the stockholders are happy. This stock went up to $676 a share upon uh, an after-hours trading of the stock. And uh, Samsung is definitely going to appeal this. Now, Scoble, he's got a, a different uh, thought on this. And, you know, I, I, kind of, uh, I kind of had to smile a little bit. Um, he says, well, you know, this uh, just cost uh, Samsung a billion dollars to be the number two mobile company in the world. And um, maybe this was a uh, this was cheap. And Samsung from the very beginning may have figured, well, what's it going to take to get to be number two? And they may have. OK, so let's say that they will. Deliberate strategy. Yeah, and so if it be, if it only costs them a billion to become the number two most profitable mobile company, um, he said this was cheap, not too bad. Now, um, this all can be flipped on its head if the judge rules that Samsung can't sell its product. Now, here's the thing: this is this is round one. This is U.S. Now, what happens when they start hitting this in international courts? Um, what do you we know if? Do you know if uh, this judgment, or do we know yet, if this judgment, they pay the billion dollars, Samsung, to Apple, does that give them license then after that? No, well, they, they got to go back and negotiate license. that. Okay. Because even, even if, you know, even if they, okay, they, they pay their billion dollar fine or whatever it's called to Apple, and then later on they, they get some deal where it's not, prohibitively expensive to license those patents. Uh, that's a heck of a deal for Samsung, I would think. Well, I think the bigger impact is the Android community because now you're going to have, you've got buttons that have been infringed. You've got, these are design elements in the Android operating system that Apple has just won patent rulings on. And guess what? It's in every phone that's running android because guess what they you know they take the software so they, you know so it was at samsung not google and android well the question is will samsung counterclaim and come back to google for money one. oh yeah i think this is just oh. in, i project this being round one now this will go up for years yeah it, it is the peels and stuff will for sure but now the question will be will you know okay here's one of the things that they um, they won. So if you have your phone and you know how you're scrolling down, you get to the bottom and it bounces back up. So if you go to like your contact list and um, you're scrolling, you see, you know how you get to the top and you, you hit it and it, it, it bounces back. Well, well, Apple has a patent on that right there, that little bounce back feature. Well, the Galaxy Nexus does that. Yeah, well, not for long. <laughs> 
because that was that was one of the infringers. And guess guess who put that in there? That you know that was put in by Google. You know that little bounce is one of the infringing issues. So um, you know, and it and it goes back to uh, the specifics of the design. Now you look at some of the Samsung could have got a little more creative. They could have hired Brian, my creative guy, and come up with some different uh, logos and stuff for the uh, the cell phone. But let's be honest, you know, a cell phone is pretty obvious that it's a phone receiver. You know, they've got this little green box with a phone in it. Can they really, you know, is, is that something that is patentable? You know, I'm just, I don't know. Well, that, that's 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 where you get into the design patent right. uh, aspects of the law, which has its own set of rules. Yep. So we'll see um, where this goes, but um, you know, this preliminary injunction could be big. It could be on iOS now. You have the notification that is exactly like what Androids had all along. So I mean, they're Apple stealing just as much back from but, but who, and but, Android is steal you know stolen from Apple. But who copied who first? Those notifications for that's the one instance I know of. The notifications was Android first. Yeah, and, and now at that same style in iOS. But unfortunately, he who submit the patent wins, <laughs> or he who is given the patent wins. And, uh, you know, you know, so, you know, this, uh, here's, you know, check this out now in Korea, of course, that's Samsung's home, tr home turf, Apple, Samsung, Apple and Sun Samsung must stop Korea sales and patent fight. So basically Korean court has come down. It says that Apple and Samsung must both stop selling some smartphones and tablet computers in South Korea and pay damages. So uh, to, whom? to each other, uh, Apple maker of iPhone violated two Samsung patents related to mobile data transfer. This is this is not at all different from the if you go back and look at the history of broadcasting and the history of radio, whether uh, it was AM patents, whether it was uh, even earlier than that, telephone patents. Uh, the uh, FM uh, radio, the uh, battles between RCA and Armstrong. Uh, uh, the battle between RCA and Farnsworth um, uh, in the television world, this is a part of the natural life cycle of a technology that has been successfully uh, commercialized. And uh, so it, I would expect over the long term, maybe over two or three years, that, uh, that you'd have round one, round two, and then finally people would say, this is really stupid. All we're doing is like beating ourselves up and enriching these lawyers along the way, and then they have a common a common patent pool that uh, that they uh, pay into and draw back proportionally. Well, they're saying this is a $219 billion global market issue. Mm -hmm. So if you think that Apple is willing to give up more than 50% of the mobile market that they, or whatever they control worldwide. And then, you know, so I wouldn't be surprised that if it isn't very long before Google is signing a bunch of agreements with Apple on licensing and royalties. So ultimately what's going to, here's what's going to happen. They're going to, these companies are going to fight to the death and then they're going to go to the table and Google's going to say, I mean, Apple's going to say, well, you're going to pay me 50 cents or dollar or three bucks or five bucks a phone for my patents. And Samsung is going to say, you're going to pay me two bucks for mine. And Microsoft is going to say, you're going to pay me a dollar for, for mine for each phone sold or whatever it is. Long Motor. story, long story short, your phones are going to get more expensive. And that's ultimately uh what will end up happening because they'll end up doing all these licenses and or, or over the long over a little bit longer period of time people in smaller innovative com companies say you know what the touch interface here actually doesn't work what we're going to have is a display and then move with accelerometers and that's how you're going to select things and have a totally different way that that actually not only circumvents those patents, but also improves 
uh, the uh, the experience, and you know that might not be a bad thing. Well, that's true, and it, it's caused definitely caused people to innovate. Is you know is always good, but you know you look at the number of patents that have been submitted, the amount of you know you just it's it's incredible the uh, the number of you know I, I I would I would hate to be in a manufacturing business or design business how do you you know how can you really not violate someone's patent if you you know unless you have a team looking at everything you know it, 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 I would be like That's, that does stifle the the uh, innovation too because you know like that what was that one uh, Oracle was suing for some line in code in Android right just a, you know a way of calling up a, a an object which was part of the the programming language. Yep. And it's yeah. because you does, know, they just wanted a few bucks out of Google. Does it stifle innovation that is revolutionary, or does it stifle uh, innovation that is evolutionary? Well, it, it does I, the I would, evolutionary that, more that than, it, than the revolutionary, the of course. The evolutionary is what gets uh, throttled. Right. But it's, just, you know, it's like, you know, so slight frustrated with it. They would get so angry <laughs> that they say, you know, I'm just going to come up with something that is totally out of left field. And, uh, and you know, kind of that's where the innovation comes while all the lawyers are getting enriched in the short term. Well, I, I definitely think the lawyers got enriched for sure. <laughs> now, what does what, what uh, your, your, your lawyer say about uh, about this, Todd? He might, that might be an interesting dinner time conversation. He may have a little different perspective. Well, I've, I've already asked him about a patent that uh, Apple was uh, issued this week. Apple wins, yes, pat Ap Apple wins patent for techniques and systems for supporting podcasting. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office granted Apple another handful of patents this week. Among this group is patent 8,245,924 that describes techniques and systems for supporting podcasting. Those techniques include ways for hosting, accessing, subscribing, managing, transferring, and or playing podcasts. Um, many of these techniques are activities you expect. When was that filed? Uh, a while ago. 2004, maybe? It was, uh, they had version 4.9 in the photo. Um, and so this is many activities that you would expect from a podcast system, including the automatic uploading, updating of podcast episodes, and the use of a portable subscription file that contains podcast information. The patent also describes a portable media device that is used to manage and play back the podcast content. This is a patent and not a trademark award. Dave Weiner doesn't have any opinion about this, does he? I haven't seen his patent. <laughs> uh, this, this is, um, for obvious reasons, is scares the hell out of me. Yeah. Um, I can't imagine Apple would want to stop a technology, but boy, they should. They sure could put the brakes on it if they, you know, charge everybody. Oh, you got to pay us a penny an episode, or even, you know, or more, or something like that. You know, so every every podcast directory out there could be violated. Now, I don't know what 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 is the date for iTunes version four. Can we figure that out? Uh, when was yeah, that? It's mid two thousand five, if I remember correctly. Version or, iTunes version four point nine. Release date. Let's look to see if we can find that. Release date was August twenty first. I'm looking for the filing date. Uh, oh, you, it's two thousand six, is what only I. Only two thousand eleven. Two thousand eleven was when it was filed. Oh August wow. August ten, two thousand eleven. Uh, it was the the patent was filed in two thousand eleven. Uh, the application was in June of two thousand nine, and okay. there's a prior. Patent. Well, there's some prior art uh, there that's uh Yeah, the prior art goes back to 1998. See, this pisses me off because plenty of prior art for this. Well, these were standard features that were on many sites for a long time. And they filed that in 2009. The, the old podcatchers uh that you know came out before 
iTunes supported podcast, and there was there ten or twelve of them, I think. You know, I can't remember iPotter and uh, what was the one that turned into lemon or juice. Wow. That uh, makes uh, for some interesting uh, reading, and it's uh, p a t f t dot uspto dot gov. And yeah. Put in that number. Yeah. And uh, there you are. So, but you know, this is a, you know, this this will be interesting. To see if this, if any, well, I, I might be the first to know about it if something does come up out of this, and then them having them going after any companies that are in the new media space. So, um, you know, definitely you're, you're like, you know, I, I, all I could say was you've got to be kidding me when I was reading this thing. Um, Wasn't there another company that got some podcasting? Yeah. Yeah. He that? got, they, they got the uh, patent on a uh, trademark or whatever it was on the word podcasting. Yeah. They, there's another group of idiots out there. They have the same, you know, this is a, uh, uh, that was that, um, what was the name of that company? Uh, you know, that was widely criticized. So now you've got two that uh, could be used against a bunch of people. But we so what we can do is we'll take uh, Leo's lead and start calling them all netcasts, and then it's a whole different thing, right? Well, you still have um, these concerns on, you know, the uh, actual uh, – this these techniques that they've written out in this uh this patent again it lays out the this techniques for supporting they include hosting accessing subscribing managing transferring and or playing podcasts you know uh, apple does not host any podcast you know so they're talking about hosting <laughs> jeez <laughs> Also, they uh, uh, explicitly say media assets can alternately pertain to videos or images. Right. Uh, so it's an extension uh, of that. Well, there's enough prior art that maybe someone can contest this, but um, you know this. You know, it's it's amazing how fast they get their patents through too. And they've got a fast. Yeah. You know, everyone there, else waits. For you. That's a project for you, Todd. What's that? Uh, you go through this thing carefully, and uh, see when Raw Voice published uh, some of their documentation, and uh, you you might be able to uh, 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 prove that you had the prior art. Uh, Andy, you know um, why? I'll let you submit that <laughs> in your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not wake the sleeping giant. Yeah. So. Yes, let's put a gator. <laughs> hey, let's uh, talk about uh, Apple TV. Well, there's word on the street now that uh, after meeting with Apple execs, uh, CNN uh, at, or the Fortune folks are saying Alice expects no television solution anytime soon. Um, a company it, update on uh, a company a company update issued Friday. Uh, basically, between takeaways from his meeting with CFO Peter Oppenheimer and Eddie Q, senior VP for Internet Service and Software. Uh, was this message about prospect of Apple making a more significant move into TV distribution? It's uh, basically not. Uh, their, I guess their talks didn't go so well with the uh, <laughs> with the television executives. Imagine that. Um, yeah, probably too expensive. Uh, I would guess that you know because it seems that the uh, the, the uh, television networks and all that you know value their content way higher than what most people would value it they basically said the apple folks said that um reiterated that the company's mantra that it will enter markets where it feel it can create great customer experiences and address key problems the key problems in television market are the poor quality of the user interface and the forced bundling of paid tv content in our view they said, while Apple could almost certainly create a better user interface, Mr. Q's commentary suggested that this would be an incomplete sol solution from Apple's perspective unless it could deliver content in a way that is different from the content multi-channel pay TV model. So um, let, let, let's look at, at that and contrast that with the situation 
where uh, where Apple was going to the record companies in 2001, 2002. Right. There, the record companies had a problem. <laughs> you know, people were just totally, widely stealing their content, and it was, you know, just a, a wildfire sort of thing. Here, the networks don't yet think they have a problem. Right. And they are much less incented to come to the table uh, compared with the recording companies. Well, they right they saw what uh, Apple did to the recording companies, and they're saying, oh, there's no way I'm getting into that model. Eventually, they're not going to have a choice is the problem because, I mean, all these cord cutters, I mean, we've pretty much cut the cord here now. Well, and we watch, you know, we watch off of an antenna. Well, so far, they haven't figured out a way to charge me for that. Here's here's the the basic fact. The television industry is a multi multi billion dollar industry. And it, and as much as I would love to see them change, I have a very strong feeling that even with cord cutters, I believe that they're going to have a dominant position in how they package their content for many, many years. I just don't, because this, this is the cash cow that keeps giving. You know, we have to realize what is involved here from a dollar's perspective. I think all of us would agree that if we could pick the channels that we wanted, we'd all probably have about 50 channels. And the rest of it, you can just flush down the toilet because it's junk. But when you get into these licensing deals and when you have uh, ESPN and they say, you have to take my 25 channels or you don't get any, you know, so and you have to pay for those 25 channels each. Um, the cable providers are like, what are they going to do? They have to have ESPN. So they are, in a sense, arm tied to do this. And what happens then is that money that comes in for those, those uh, be able to put those channels on those television fuels the ESPN engine so that they can do more content, have more advertisers, build more channels. So it's just this ever, ever growing animal. Uh, there's, there's another key element, and that element is that a traditional over the air broadcast as well as our just traditional system whether it's cable over the air or satellite coverage distributed is very very deeply embedded in our political process true such that um that is an incredible source of revenue you know particularly in smaller markets in swing states um that uh it, it, it their financial survival year to year d depends upon you know that uh, that political advertising cycle that comes that comes through. Likewise, politicians highly dependent on getting out the word to to the public. So you've got an ecosystem that uh, works quite well. Thank you, and we don't need to uh, distribute uh, to uh, uh, disrupt that. So and I guess my question is then: Why doesn't um, Apple do what they can to promote this? you know, promote as much alternative media as possible. Do they, are they, they, do they think that the average consumer doesn't want to see the tech podcast channel on the Apple TV, that the average consumer wants to see um, ABC instead? And is that the reason why they feel that this is not, uh, this market that we're involved in is not uh, worthy enough of, or maybe that's why they went after that uh, podcasting patent or those patents. You know, they may they may be thinking, well, we're not getting anywhere with the with the traditional media. Let's uh, beef up the uh, alternative media. Well, I was looking on. Uh, well, I, did, I did a Google search that iTunes 4.9 came out in June of 2005. So that was the reference to that software was June of 2005, even though it was filed later. They did reference the uh, the first version of iTunes that had podcasting support. So uh, I don't know, Mike. Um, we'll we'll see, and we'll see what they do with this um, over time. But you know, I I really and would be surprised if they did not come out with some device, some new device, or some updated 
features. You know, I, I just don't understand yet why they haven't opened up the App Store to the Apple TV. Maybe what they were trying to do, and maybe this is why, maybe they were trying to keep that menu pure until they were able to get these peering agreements in place with the broadcasters. Do you think that is maybe why they haven't opened up the App Store to the Apple TV? That very well could be, and part of that deal is too, you know, you can watch, you can get apps from some of these networks already for iOS. So like if you want to watch NBC News, I mean, they don't give you the whole thing live or anything, but you can watch clips of it there on your app. And if they open that app store, then you'd be bypassing, you know, Apple's deal with NBC or whoever at that time. Maybe that's why they're not doing it. Uh, but you know, Apple, when when they do say say they were trying to beef up alternative media, they're gonna have total control over that. They're, they're not gonna let you know just anybody get in there. Uh, you know, right. if they to do something like that, as is like you know with their apps, you know they they all of a sudden decide okay we've got too many fart apps for the iPhone, so no more fart apps. Right. Well, thing with tech shows, you know, oh well, we've got three tech shows, that's enough, no more. So Andy, but you just, have to remember that their responsibility to, the, to their stockholders is to move as much hardware at uh, favorable, if not monopoly, uh, margins as possible. And the way that they have done that historically, if you look back, uh, there, there was uh, some analysis of the introduction of the iPad that because of Apple's secrecy, uh, our surrounding products, you know, they, they will never have the pre announce. They don't talk to the press. They don't talk to bloggers. So everybody is speculating what this might be. And the value of that speculation by, by being secretive, everybody speculates and all this media buzz comes up that, that they're not paying for at all. And I remember the, this, the one study was like, they got $400 million worth of media coverage and it didn't cost them a penny. Now, right at the start of, of audio podcasting, if you remember, before you had a lot of content in there, here was a way to bring in podcasters to provide content to fill the box because your business is selling these boxes at these high, these high margins. So it, 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 I think the, the calculus is probably that uh, could you sell more Apple TVs if you had another 250 channels on there? That that's probably not clear, and the way that they uh, the way they do that is is preserving that that uh, that total user experience throughout. And uh, it's when you look at it from their business model, it doesn't make sense for them to encourage informal content. Well, if if you look at it an, another way too, Andy, is that yeah, they're there to sell hardware, but they have a whole monster business that's built on the back of that 30% margin for every app they sell and every TV program that they get subscribed to and every magazine that's sold through the app store. Yeah, that's 30%. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. That goes to Apple every time a sale is made. And, you know, number one, here's, here's this is, a, you know, you think about their ecosystem. This is why their stock is at $670 a share. You buy this phone, and you pay more than any other phone, and and then you fill it full of apps. And you know, I'm just looking at my thing. I'm like one, two, three, four, and then I've got how many windows? One, two, three, four. I I got a hundred plus apps. So maybe I, I'm not a typical customer, but they made an additional thirty dollars on me just in app buys. Plus on my iPad, I know that I've rented you know, maybe 50 movies. So that's an extra three bucks. And the TriCaster just uh, started going slow. Yeah, and yeah lost, we, I lost your return on uh, video here. All right, so hang on, guys. We're going to have to do a, a reset. Damn this thing. Let me uh, let me stop the recording. And we'll, we'll pick this up in just a second. I'm going to – Skype isn't going to go down, but I, the stream's going to go down. Well, that's definitely something to uh, discuss with New Tech again. You know, it, it only happens once in a while. But, you know, that, Andy, is one of those situations where you just absolutely lose your mind because you're in the middle of something. 
and uh, oh, yeah. the, the technology fails you. Um, I think I see if this did the stream recover. Yeah, I don't you're, know. If you're this... now you're now in the uh, hidden hidden files directory looking for a file extension, right? No, I, I it'll say it allows me to save the file. I can stop the recording and the recording gets saved, but it's just that uh, ten or fifteen second segment is uh, is now choppy, you know, and um, it's it's just uh, beyond irritating. I, I'm I'm this is the second time it's happened during a live event. It usually happens later. And uh, they had sent me a new update here last week, and I installed that. And you can see that it has worked. Um, <laughs> but th they got a serious issue. They have got to get with, this with, figured with out. Their, with every, every uh, cent you paid for the patch, huh? <clears throat> well, you know, you got a $30,000 box sitting on a damn shelf, and it's chopping. You know, yeah. it's uh, that's some bullshit right there. Be honest with you. They, okay. They got they got a sixty thousand dollar box if that doesn't happen to us. What they're telling you? Yeah, uh, we'll see. Yeah. But they they got to get this fixed, you know. So uh, you know, if nothing else, enough embarrassment, and because uh, I'll send them these video clips, you know. Like damn, you're just going live, and you're like, it just. I mean, I just, I'm sitting here, and my brain is exploding. Literally, brain is exploding at this point. And I don't get pissed very often, but. <laughs> 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 only, only, only in, uh, on dates that end in Y. Huh? <laughs> oh, I'm sending this to you, new tech. You can watch this in the engineering room. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, man. Piss me off bad. <laughs> All right, audience. And now that you've heard me vent, uh, you know, it's. And we're not even pushing this thing. It's not even being pushed. It's not even making it work hard. <laughs> just just uh, breathing easy. Yeah, breathing easy. Oh, all right. You got that's, yourself a union uh, uh, box there. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a, something to that effect. Now, this union box may be on its way back to San Antonio, Texas to be to looked at and be replaced. Jeez. Uh, all right. Um, Let's let's move on here. And uh, we talked about Apple TV. And if those of you that are like, wow, you're going to finish the discussion on Apple TV? I don't know. What do you guys think is going to happen? Do you think is it, they're going to come out with a new box? Is it going to be we're going to be disappointed and wait until next year or, or what? I, th I, think, I, think, I think they, I think they I th will. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Enough delay here. Uh but I, th I think they're not going to come out with a television. Uh, that seems to they keep talking about that rumor. But really, uh, you know, an upgraded Apple TV box that does more would be a whole lot easier for them, uh, I would think. I mean, yeah, it'd be really cool to have a, you know, I've got a 27-inch iMac here. It'd be really cool to have a TV that looks just like this. But I can't imagine them making a 40-inch or a 60-inch screen. Right. You know, I, I think it's a whole lot better for them to, you know, probably team up with Samsung, believe it or not, and maybe put it in a, a Samsung TV or have a, a box that you just plug into the HDMI like they have now. Well, I think the folks at uh, Vizio, um, you know, they just come out with their own Google TV in a, in a, in a hockey puck. And, um, you know, so... This you know the set top box market is is not going to get any smaller and, and you know I look at the stats and uh, Roku is just rocking the house um, so is Google TV um, Apple TV is doing okay on a few shows and I'm still trying to figure out how those shows are doing so well there's some dynamic there I'm not understanding yet but you know I guess Andy if we go back and if I get on my train of thought here what I was going to ask you earlier is. You know, you've got a channel on Roku. We've got three channels on Roku, but there's now 360 channels on Roku again. You know, how many apps they have. So we were talking yesterday about Discovery. Discovery is becoming an issue again. No, oh, it, absolutely, it absolutely is. And I think that uh, uh, one of the things that we all have to recognize in, in the new media space is the, is the relationship uh, between the types of, of informal content that we're that we are are producing and distributing, 
in the social media uh, aspects because that's where a lot of the discovery is taking place. I'm not sure how many people are going to the uh, uh, going to to the uh, uh, to the iTunes store in the podcast section searching for a particular class of uh, of shows or uh, uh, media outlets to, to to examine I would suspect that the, the much more effective uh, uh, way that awareness comes about is the distribution through uh, uh, Facebook Twitter uh, other forms of, uh, of, of social media that that's the discovery engine that's actually working for uh, for us now. Well, and I think too, as I I physically tell people, or me, not physically, I tell people, go to the Roku, go you to the box. Grab them by the throat if you could. Yeah, you know, go to the Roku, go to the Samsung Smart TV, go to the you know, the, and get the show there. Go to the Tech Pass channel, but they're going to have to physically go do that. Mm-hmm. You know, and if they don't physically go do that then their chances of just finding or the average Joe finding this show surfing, you know, you think about it. You have to, even on the Google TV, you got to load the app. You have to navigate. And, you know, that's just, that's just like, that's a whole, you could lose 90% of them right there in itself. Um, so, you know, I think you're right. I don't think you're going, the only way you're going to get people are the people that are really dedicated going to look. Now, what I like about Google TV is I just say, hey, just enter geeknewscentral.com and you can play the content right on your Google TV right from the web page. And that works fantastic. Um, same thing with a live stream. They can just go on Google TV and just watch the live stream that way as well. So yeah, I think we just have to do real a real good job of, of promoting. Yeah, it's uh, good old, same old marketing. Yeah. Yeah is getting things out there because there's it's so there's so much content available like when podcasting first start, started out you know you were you were probably one of uh you know maybe 50 or 100 podcasts but, in the world but just remember too when podcasting started in october 2004 there was no apple it was we did this or you know curry and weiner did this on their own and put together the the tools needed to make this thing be distributable via software, and yeah, there and was podcast no podcast alley. And podcast alley was the discovery uh, mechanism. That's right. And what is yeah. podcast alley now? Podcast alley now is just a a where uh, a barren wasteland for uh, advertisements, and they get a, probably get a little bit of traffic on. Matter of fact, I haven't been over there, and and I'm I'm a good friends with the with the writer of this. And I haven't been over there in years. Um, let me bring it up on the page. Is it uh, Chris? Was that his name? Yeah, Chris McIntyre. So you know, I they start, still yeah. they still have a you know, it's still got a top ten list, and you know, the site has not changed that much uh, in they, a long time. They're owned by Mevio, though, aren't you? Aren't they? Well, he's no, I th- he's no longer with Mevio, and I think he owns. Podcast Alley again. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm just going in here and looking at the looking at the directory a little bit. And let's, let's see if he's actually still got my show listed in here. Geek News Central. It's one of the first listings on the site. Looking at the uh, copy right now, it does say uh, Chris McIntyre and PodcastAlley.com. So, yeah. But Mevio is listed there. So. so if I go see details, uh, last time that page was updated was 2010. And let's look at this one. Uh, yeah, this this has this page has not been updated since 2010. So there's not even active listening listings in here at all. Um, so you know this is a there's another one. Geek, I don't have a daily. Yeah, none of these are up to date. This hasn't. Uh, this site's DOA. You yeah, know, in 2010, their uh, uh, PodCamp Boston you being know, promoted for 2010. So you know, and in another place was was a, was of course was Podcast Pickle that people used to go to, and uh, that's run by by Gary out of uh, Dallas, and uh, active. But I don't know as that website is. So, yeah, that site is still up, but 
I don't know if there's anything. Now, there's still some farm posts and stuff um, that are going on, but it used to be able to find uh, shows here real easy. And uh, they're still, I guess they're still here. Um, Gary had this, uh, was all built by a, well, he's got my show, so let's look and see if it's actually being pulled. Oh, that looks like it went to a dead page. Okay. So it looks like there's some issues there. So, you know, some of the original sites are, are DOA. Now, of course, I'm proud to say our site is still up and running and, and is doing fine and uh, being updated and having all of the uh, variety of content. But, um, yeah, so... I think Blueberry is probably the most active podcast directory out there right now, other than maybe iTunes. Yeah, I would, I would think so. I don't think there's anybody else that uh, is really out there. And we, and we've, you know, we got twelve thousand active shows, so and it's those are, are are managed as well. But so you know, where does this, this, you know, and this we don't consider Blueberry dot com to be a discovery site. You know, we don't want it to be a discovery site. We want it to be a site where content creators come in and, and interact with us and the discovery we want the discovery to happen on your own site you know we that's the main thing we the the goal is to have people have their discovery at their own locations you know and i want people to come to geeknewcentral.com and sdrnews.com and the geek of the north and i don't want them coming to blueberry to find your shows so but it is what it is. All right, let's switch gears here. Um, let's talk about DMCA a little bit. And uh, where am I at on time? Okay, we're okay on time. Uh, Google your old takedown request up 100% in a month, up to up 1,137% 1, in 2011. And basically, the folks over at torrentfreak.com are reporting that the massive wave of DMCA takedowns sent by right holders to Google in recent months is growing at an astounding rate. During the past month, the number of takedown received by the search engine doubled almost 1.5 million URLs per week. To put that into perspective, exactly one year ago, URL takedown numbers just numbered 131,000. And um, it, this is an incredible number of URL takedown notices. And this is in part because Google has said that they are going to now start depreciating. Um, they're going to start depreciating sites that get too many takedown notices. So that makes you sit back and go, hmm, now do you know if you've had a URL takedown notice? Do they notify you? I, I don't know if they do or don't. I've never received one. Um I mean, the way you could test that, just put a print song up and see how long it uh, takes them to uh, come after you. You know, Andy, uh, I'll let you volunteer to do that on your <laughs> site. You know, um, I, I, you know, I, I got, I got pounded by the uh, Panda update, and I'm my traffic is finally getting back to pre-Panda, um, pre-Panda hit. I guess I'm three quarters of the way back. I still have a quarter to go. But, um, you know, that's pretty devastating when you lose half your traffic due to a, a Google search algorithm update that you have no idea what you were doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing I can attest it to is my show notes. So if, if you notice now, my show notes are all over at uh, gncshownotes.com. And, you know, really, I think what the problem was, and let me show you the, the site. Whoops. What I think the problem was, was the links. My link density per post were pretty heavy. So I'd have the blog post, and then I'd have 40 very short links linking off to all the articles I covered in the show. And I think Google was finally decided I was some sort of link baiter or something. They didn't say so. And I had submitted the site for uh, adjudication or whatever they do when you – when you get hit like that, they said, oh, no, we didn't penalize you. Um, but something did. So anyway, um, 
what do you guys think about these increase in takedowns? Does it concern you at all? And, you know, obviously, if you're not dealing with anything, maybe it doesn't. But mm-hmm. what's to stop someone from trying to destroy a, a person's uh, website by submitting, you know, sketchy malicious, uh, uh, malicious uh, uh, takedown notice? Yeah. Like, you know, there's a lot on YouTube in particular. You know, you'll put something up on YouTube. It has no content that's uh, copyrighted other than by you. And somebody in Brazil will tell you to take it or tell them to have it, you take it down. Well, do you guys? Uh, I think ahead. Jeffrey Powers was having an issue with that uh, for some, you know, music that I think he even wrote. I don't know. I, I, I talked to him this week and. I remember him saying something about that. Now, do you guys hear when I was um, I did a, a Google Live Hangout uh, during the Curiosity landing, and there was just three or four of us in the Hangout. It wasn't very many people, but I recorded it, and it was being published on YouTube uh, um, after I got done. And you know, so what I've got is I've got the NASA uh, JPL live stream up, and I'm switching between that and us, and it's you know, and so. Everything from NASA is uh, public domain. And um, so we got all done. And, you know, I, I let the YouTube video get posted to YouTube, let it publish. And uh, it wasn't 24 hours later. And I got like 15 emails in a row. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, your content is being in violation by um, such an ABC News website. Your, your website content is copyright violation by Fox. All of, all of them. Every one of those news organizations claiming the same exact copyright against that video. Yeah, that, that that's uh, not surprising because the bot is uh, is uh, looking at the audio stream. No, and uh, and the video you're, stream. You're, you're you're they're rebroadcasting the same uh, public domain content that you are. Right. So all our public domain. Every and I, I wonder if uh, Google's bot automatically sent takedown notices to them against for me. Yes, you know, so you know, I didn't send out any, but this automated machine is, uh, you know, is is sending out the and and, it, and so this isn't going to count against you. I'm like, well, crap, it's going to count against you. So I just unpublished. I deleted the video. I didn't need the hassle at the time, um, and it just disgusted me because. It was pu- all public domain, and no one owned that video. I'm I'm scared now, in my show, to run any video clips. Um, you know, showing web pages, I think, still is pretty safe. You know, but if I was to show a YouTube video, and do a you know, and we're talking about it, and we're actually, you know, giving credit to the website, and we're you know we're we're falling within fair use standards. Um, there is no more fair use when it comes to YouTube. So the question is, is there not going to, is there, are they going to start looking at our sites, looking at our video embeds on our sites and saying, okay, you're, you're a copyright violator. Um, we're going to take you down. Um, even though you're not posting a video to YouTube. So I've I've had, uh, I've had, uh, uh, take down notices for clips from short clips that we have, have pulled from YouTube. And, uh, uh, and and in fact, in that particular situation, I got, uh, just as you, I got a little bit concerned as far as what was going on. And so I actually, uh, you know, went back to the, to the person who was claiming the origination, who had originally posted it. And um, it was just kind of the trail kind of went, kind of went cold. I mean, they said, you know, we don't care. Um, and you know verbally, but uh, somewhere it was tripping up that bot. Well, you know you can go in and go through the process of saying this is not copyright violation. You know you have to do that for each of these videos, yeah. and you got to explain it because if you don't, you know the way Google's new, I guess new plan is is that it's they're going to start penalizing sites. And I think this increase in DMC takedowns is just a direct result of Google saying that they're going to punish these sites. Yeah, I've got a friend that's a fairly famous banjo player, and he put up videos of his own music, of him playing, and he got takedown notices because, you know, he's also got a record company. 
And of course, the record company doesn't care whether he puts his songs up there because he's not one of their big artists. But their but, label, and they've got all their content registered, and it automatically flagged, and yeah. he can't have his own stuff up there. But he, he, you know, he worked it out with him, and, and he's able to, but you know, the, the fact is he puts a new video up and immediately gets takedown notices. Even though he's got permission from his record company, plus it's his own stuff. Right. I've got to shut a window here, guys, because it's uh, blowing. Uh, uh, it's The wind is blowing the curtain, and the curtain is uh, showing a big blot of sun trying to blast my face here. So ah, I got that trade wind yeah. problem again, huh? Yeah. Yeah, see, when you're down in a basement like me, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Tra only trade winds out there today are 90-degree uh, winds unless it, unless it comes off the lake. <laughs> Okay, uh, crisis diverted. So uh, you didn't need to see the. I got you know how I, how I close my window when there's an emergency like that, right? I don't know that that's uh, crisis averted, Todd. Uh, really? Move to your left. Just move to your left about an inch and a half. Well, I'm not. I don't. I'm looking at the video and it's not in my face right now. So. <laughs> yeah, it was there for was there for a moment. Was for a second, huh? <laughs> Funny. Well, maybe I'll keep you up. Yep, I keep getting blasted, don't I? <laughs> it's that time of year where the sun is just in the right spot. It just sucks. And it tells me it's time to get ready to get done here. Uh, hey, the White House, <laughs> and being open, uh, you know, they've been real open uh, since they've... <laughs> we won't get into that. But, hey, they have open-sourced their online petition system. So if you're a Drew Paul user... Did you know the White House site's running on Drew Paul? Um, or at least this uh, online petition system is. The, uh, they, the, the source code for We the People, the online petition system, has been a popular way for the public to connect with the White House. They've made that petition system, op basically made it available on GitHub to be able to go down and, and download it and play with it if you want it. So if that had been a WordPress plugin, that would have been pretty cool, but uh, I guess it's running on Drew Paul. So, uh, and if you got any Drupal sites still running, you can uh, you can grab that. No, I don't it. don't have any Drupal sites. But you know, one of the uh, one of the big problems with that was that the uh, uh, legalization for marijuana seemed to take up about a third of the capacity of that server, and uh, it, it, with repetitive suggestions and petitions. So, uh, it it may have been uh, an overload problem. <laughs> and I can't get all the way to that sunlight. It's still whacking me here in the in the cheek. Um, what do you guys think about uh, Microsoft's uh, a new logo there? I, I, you know, it's not that impressive, but there, boy, what do you think? So, Todd, if you got paid 3% of, of the money that they put into that, you could retire <laughs> a happy and rich man. A happy it and a whole lot different than the other one. I mean, I don't know. Looks simple. Well, you know what I think it is is that's how their metro interface is. Is everything's all lined up and it's sort of sort of plain. You know, it's probably just a branding thing. I just become unplugged from my headset. Uh, I'm batting a thousand never, right now. On, Andy. Where is my plug? <laughs> yeah, I I uh, don't know if Todd's uh, hearing us here or not. Yeah, I think you're right that the metro interface or th that which is the the uh, the interface formerly known as Metro. Um, yeah, they're formerly but, known as it, Metro. <laughs> yeah, uh, that 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 that's uh, you know they're they're trying to reconcile that visually. That'd be a question for Brian, your creative director. There, he he can explain fully what's going on. Well, you know, I think the uh, the logo is just kind of boring. I'm you know I'm not overall impressed with the uh, with the level of effort there that they uh, well, they had. Interface is boring too, so it. it helps i mean <laughs> they complement one another yeah well besides the logo the fcc this week approved verizon's controversial spectrum purchase from cable companies so now the cable companies are well if they haven't been already but they're completely in bed uh completely in bed with the with the companies now so verizon is is going to clean everyone's clock with this purchase, and I, I don't know, I just see the blurring of the lines here becoming narrower when it comes to competition. 
Yeah, I, speaking of Verizon, I have to call them today. Uh, I'm finally going to have to switch off of my unlimited data plan. <laughs> oh, they're forcing you off, yeah? Yeah, they, they're they not forcing me off, but they're uh, making it increasingly hard to, uh, to make any changes to my account. And I finally said, ah, you know, I've, I've looked at it over the last year. I've not gone over three gigabytes on my data, and I don't plan on going over that. So I can buy their four gig plan and be about the same as I am. But anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> not what we were talking about. So this details of this basically this deal is Ryzen is going to have to give up uh, some spectrum to some smaller carriers in uh, local markets. So I know, you know, every local market has a, uh, you know, one of these, you know, small cellular carriers, although they're becoming more, uh, you, you don't see them as much anymore. Um, but uh, they are going to have to give up some of those holdings. They're going to have to get some stuff to T-Mobile as well, which is interesting. Uh, they're going to have to get some stuff to Cricket, uh, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. But um, overall, what they have to give up for what they're getting is pretty pretty narrow. But I think this is a bigger problem all, overall that, uh, you know, overall they're saying that they're really short on Spectrum. And there's going to become a real issue here in the next two or three years if 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 the growth of utilization of data on the Internet continues. And I think it leads into the the AT and T situation with FaceTime. I don't know if you guys followed that or not at all this week or not. But you guys have any comments at all on the Verizon acquisition of all this wireless uh, spectrum from the cable companies? I I think that uh, it it just just contributes further, you know, in the in the wireless space to the situation that you have in the wired space that uh, it, it de facto there's going to be uh, little or no competition. Yeah, right. As it is right now, there's basically two players in most markets that are, are worth getting on. And, you know, was it uh, AT&T was trying to buy a T-Mobile? And, you know, all these little carriers, believe it or not, we still have Altel around here. Uh, this was one of the markets that uh, Verizon had to uh, sell off part of the Altel thing when they acquired them. Right. So there's still Altel here, which would, I guess, be considered one of those smaller ones that uh, you were talking about, Todd. Well, with AT&T making their comment on uh, basically saying if you don't have a shared data plan with family members, um, you're not going to be able to use FaceTime over their network on your phone. You're, you, they want you to upgrade to a shared data plan and uh otherwise tough you can't use facetime uh via their uh their wire their wireless network and they're or is they going to block facetime by name or is it facetime and similar sorts of apps well facetime's already been blocked from utilization on your wireless you can't use facetime without being on wi-fi mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm getting a lot of noise from someone i don't know where it's come which i just heard it come up as well yeah. So well, I, mute, I muted myself and it's still I heard it. So. Yeah. Uh, it might be uh might be a, an indicator, Todd. Hurry up and we'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll go down the list here. <laughs> so anyway, they they there was big commentary on that all week and uh but it it's uh it's just another uh another attempt by AT&T to uh, to limit the uh the utilization of their network and try they're saying it's to preserve so they have enough bandwidth uh, to be able to serve their customers that's their excuse speaking of verizon did you guys hear about the the uh are they were blocking these uh third-party tethering apps and because of their 700 megahertz spectrum deal from a few years ago they uh they were ordered to allow those apps to con you know to continue to work yeah, they've uh, they got slapped pretty hard. They got uh, hundred, I think, hundred thirty some million dollar fine, and uh, they so now they're. I don't know if they've opened that up because of that decision, but uh, you shouldn't have to have a tethering plan to tether your Verizon uh, device anymore. Hey, mine mine works great. Well, I'm not using the the Verizon one. Well, just remember that's on their. LTE network only, so it doesn't count for your uh, for your 3G. your three G uh, iPhone on Verizon. Until you get a LTE 
phone, they won't be. You still have to pay the extra for them on an iPhone standpoint. I got the Galaxy Nexus. So I'm so 4G. So you're on. You're on 4G. Have either of you got your custom URLs at Google Plus yet? No. No. So I guess all three of us are not cool kids on the block. And, and Michael Dell of Dell Computer has mine. Oh, so he uh, he he was able to get his already, huh? Well, you have to come up with something different, Mike. <laughs> the real Michael Dell. <laughs> and it's not it's not like there's uh, very many Michael Dells in the United States. <laughs> Few of them, I guess. <laughs> um, I read a an article on uh, earlier in the week talking about a guy, and this is an underbelly article talking about a guy that worked at Google, and his job was to every day, eight hours a day, look at uh, the underbelly of the network. And it would be, uh, it, you know, basically kid porn, uh, pedophile stuff. Uh, and he basically would have to go and if there was an incident reported, he would have to review it and make sure the content was what it was, flag it, remove it, you know, do the uh, the whole reporting thing. And uh, he did this job for a year and uh, as a contractor and uh, started having some uh, mental stability issues. And uh, because he was forced to see all this, and he was basically had to look at beheadings, uh, bestiality, you just name it, just everything disgusting in the book. And uh, Google would only pay for a single uh, therapy session for him and basically told him to take care of the rest of it on his own. And then when it came to the one-year mark where he would have transitioned from a contractor to a full-time employee, Google says, we don't need your services anymore. Can you even, first of all, can you guys even imagine having to look at this incredible amount of absolute filth? I can imagine it would uh, mess with your mind a bit, especially, you know, the whole year. You the know. thing I would be wondering about is how does how does somebody that does that stay out of the uh, stay out of jail basically? Well, they're their enforcement. They're part of their enforcement arm. So I'm sure there are provisions. You know, that was kind of the first thing I thought about. But you know, when he was hired, he basically was told you're gonna be reviewing content. And he really wasn't told what he was being hired for, and he kind of found out later. But I just can't imagine. I, I mean, honestly, I, I think I'd last about 15 minutes. I, I don't. I, so to have to think about, you know, you would think that if you're, and I'm sure all these companies have individuals like this that have to do this job. And, you know, that has to be one of the, it, 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 they should be paid gr significant money to do this. Well, thousands of cops around the country have to look at that kind of stuff also. And, they, you know, I don't think the incident of mental illness is any higher for cops than it would be. You but, know, but do they, I don't know. But do they have to sit there and look at it every day? Is, is there divisions with do, this? bigger departments. Oh, my God. I just can't imagine. There's probably a, a significant story about that just in itself, you know. But, um, yeah, there was a couple of discussions about it over at BuzzFeed.com talking about this uh, whole underbelly and how it uh, is reported and um, then acted upon and deleted. And But uh, if you think someone, you know, this, they had a whole division of people that were doing this. This is just one guy. So you, how do you then, you know, all this stuff is going up. You, How do you, you'd think there would have to be some sort of, I would think that, that at, at some level in the short term that they could say, well, particularly if it were tied in with law enforcement, right. to where they could see that they were actually a big part of getting these people off the street or getting getting these people shut down, um, that, that there could be some um, uh, satisfaction there. But it, it would be you know, similar to uh, to other law enforcement uh, jobs, uh, you know, uh, grisly uh, murders or or, yeah. or people who do uh, child welfare, welfare types of, uh, of things that uh, wouldn't be to this degree, but just in general. 
Yeah, I, I just to me it was just incredible, and I was I first of all I was pretty disgusted that um that the guy is saying hey I need some help or he didn't he didn't say he was needed some help, but his coworkers told him you need some help, and he guys said oh really and I'm my personality's changing and he's oh yeah there's, something's going on with you you need some help so as you know his coworkers kind of noticed a, a shift in his uh, mindset but. Um, it, uh, I, I guess it would affect anyone to a certain, you, I just can't imagine how you couldn't be affected. Wasn't there a story this week about how Google's, uh, giving you know, all these great benefits, uh, even after death? Oh, uh, they do have, my God, they have a one heck of a death benefit plan. Uh, they do do that right. Um, you know, this story aside, you, you know, if you, if you die in a, Good mental health coverage. Yeah, if you die in the job at Google, your spouse is going to get your paycheck for ten years. So uh, the key is to go to work for Google full time before you die. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, guys, that uh, that kind of wraps up what I had today. Did you guys see anything uh, specific in the news that uh, caught your attention? Now that I mentioned to that uh, Samsung thing that I thought about a little bit, little bit later, you know, uh, we understand what Apple's business model is and their responsibility to their stockholders. Uh, you know, Samsung is a widely diversified company, and uh, in the greater scheme of things, you know, as Mike mentioned, maybe the billion-dollar tax is something that uh, could work into their plans. But uh, uh, you know, to be number two. And to have the economies of scale that you get uh, for your DRAM chips and for your other uh, components, it may be uh, not such a bad thing from a broader stockholder perspective as uh, what uh, what it might first uh, 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 appeal or appear. And and I think Samsung I read somewhere was like a forty billion dollar company. So it yeah, it's a major major hit, but it's not a catastrophic survival of the company kind of hit. Uh, in this uh, billion dollar uh, fine. And what's funny is where one division's fighting, the, another one is saying, uh, what's your next order of screens and components, please? Yeah. So but that's they're, they're so spread out that, that the, you know, one, one division of the company has little or nothing to do with the other division of the company. You know, it's be, it'd be like, uh, you know, the Cadillac division of GM making a particular car and the uh, the AC Delco spark plug division of the thing, have, you know, they don't have anything to do with each other. That's true. But I'm sure I would not want to be the lawyers on the losing team from Samsung. Um, <laughs> A career limiting situation there. <laughs> yeah. Um, remind me never to hire them as a, an attorney. Well, I hope I would never need an attorney to that scale anyway. But Did, did you see that uh, Conan O'Brien spoof? I did. Uh, I did. That was pretty funny. It was good. So at least someone's lighthearted. But anyway, $1.059 billion. That's just, uh, I wonder if they got that laying around in their petty cash fund, Andy. Uh, th I don't know if being petty cash, but they probably, uh, uh, you could get their hands on that pretty quickly. <laughs> I mean, a company of that size. N not probably that give, give Apple a credit on their screens. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> So yeah, you could pay. We'll 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 uh we'll just not charge you for parts for the next uh, six months or so. <laughs> well, guys, uh, I'm uh, I cannot avoid the sun. I, it, what it is is my curtain over here has uh, like three little places where the sun can get through, and of course it's getting me right there, face. right there in my forehead. And uh, every place I seem to move in the picture today, the the sun is following me. So. Um, everyone else that's been listening, I'm sure you guys are watching, you've probably been laughing. Look at that knucklehead. So, hey, as always, folks, you can reach the show here, geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline is 619-342-7365. Uh, reach me on Twitter at Geek News. Andy, uh, where can I reach you these days? Uh, SDRnews.com, and uh, Twitter is uh, AXMC. Uh, and uh, and uh, Mike, how about you? Uh, geekofthenorth.com and uh, my Twitter handle is Geek of the North. Yeah, did I have that right on your lower third? Let me look at that. Yeah, uh, geekofthenorth.com. So I did have it right. Okay. Um, 
So uh, how was your trip out to L.A., Mike? I wanted to, what, what happened with Ford? Oh, yeah, that was uh, that was very cool. And I'll have a write-up over at Geek News Central uh, probably by the end of the weekend. Uh, cool. Uh, what uh, vehicle did you get to drive? I uh, went out there to drive the C-Max Hybrid, which uh, the C-Max is kind of a, a tall wagon version of the Focus. And, and, and how was it? It was pretty good, especially since they let us uh, compare a Prius with it. They really? actually had some Priuses there, and we could go take a competitive drive. Oh, that's new. <clears throat> it was very cool. And the thing we noticed, or the thing I noticed, we were up in the mountains in Malibu, and I drove the, the uh, C Max on the same loop and then drove the Prius V, which is their tall wagon version of the Prius. And that Prius felt like it was working its butt off getting up the hill, where the C Max just sort of loafed up the hill. But you know they're fifty horsepower difference. So. Yeah, so you you don't think that uh, Ford uh, kind of knew that when they sent you out? Did they give you a course to drive? <laughs> yeah, they give us a course uh, to drive each of the cars. You know, at once we were at the lunch break there in Malibu, and uh, so we could compare them and it. Like I said, it was a noticeable difference, but I'm sure, you know, if you look at the specs, if, if the Prius would have been closer in horsepower, they probably wouldn't have had one there. Yeah. So how uh, many? Go ahead. And, but, you know, it was a very comfortable car for a small car. It's very, you know, very comfortable. And it actually had a little more room than the Escape. Huh. You know, I rode with uh, Jeffrey. You know, we we rode together and at and both, you know, both events and, and we actually had more room in this little car than we did in that SUV. That's interesting. So how many people were out at this one? How many people came to this event? It was fairly small. I think they, they only had like uh, 15 cars. So there was might have been 30 people. Oh, so pretty small event. And they did they do more than one wave this time, or did they just do a single wave? No, there was three waves. So okay. Was, people were coming in as we were leaving. All right, guys. Um, well, it sounds like fun. We'll look forward to seeing you. I hope you got a little video for us too, Mike. Do you have a video for us on the? Oh yeah, oh. I'll put I'll put it up on the special media feed here uh, probably uh, tomorrow sometime. All right, very very cool. All right, uh, Andy, everyone, thanks for uh, thanks for coming out today, and those of you on the stream, thanks for being here. And uh, I don't know if we're going to go into a replay mode with our little technical difficulty we had earlier. I might might be able to get it chopped out. But uh, everyone else, thanks for guys. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next go around. And everyone on the live stream, uh, take care and, and aloha. Yeah.